Am I on? Ah, I'm on. I thought I'd been off for years. <laughs> That's what they all say. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, musicians and friends and techies, nerds, hangers-on. Did I address everybody? I think I did. If I left anybody out, please let me know at the end of the show, and then I'll leave the building. Um, I'm very honored to be here tonight uh, to speak to y'all, but that's if I was down south, but I figure y'all kind of gets y'all in there. Um, I got to speak about some of the things I've been up to. But firstly, uh, I would like to thank the entire team at Sweetwater. What a beautifully cool building that you have to work in. And it's green. Congratulations. What a wonderful bunch of people. I've, I've never met the, way, the, the Sweetwater people until today, until the Waves people brought me in, and I'm suitably impressed. The great studios, and what a marvelous facility. And I didn't realize that this building is little more than a year old. Not even it took them, that's how long it took them to build it. It's quite, quite an accomplishment. I'd also like to thank the Waves team for putting this event together namely Mick Olish, who you've just met, S Scott Simon, and Mike Pearson Adams. Did I get that right, Mike Pearson Adams? Yes, sir. Uh, a little round of applause for these <laughs> lovely gentlemen. Well, um, I guess I was born in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and I was very fortunate I had a, um, a musical education uh, studied classical piano, and um, I emigrated to England in 1960 uh, and soon found my way into the recording studio business. In fact, um, how I started was, was as a T-boy. Anybody know what a T-boy was or is? Well, a T-boy is basically a gopher, you know. And you would come in with this big tray of tea and say, ah, excuse me, you want a cup of tea, more sugar? And they would look at you like, yeah, get out of here, you silly kid. Well, anyway, that's what I was doing. And I used to sweep the floors and clean the bathrooms. And this is prior to any sort of schooling, official schooling that one could get. There was no full sale. There was no Berkeley. There was none of that. And you just learned by people kicking you in the, in the rear and saying, all right, you better learn how to do that. Otherwise, you're fired. Um, so that's what I was. I was a little tea boy. But I was really lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. And the engineers who were in London at that time were absolutely marvelous. I was very fortunate. I studied with a guy named Bob Auger at Pi Studios in London. And the kind of sessions we would do uh, one day we would be out on the road with a little um, three-track half-inch Ampex machine and three U47 microphones, and we would go to Walthamstow Town Hall and record a 90-piece orchestra. We'd put up three mics, left, center, right, okay, go, and that would be it. I mean, basically, well, it wasn't quite that simple, but the next day we were back at Pi Studios and we'd be recording gong, 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 gong. We'd be recording the kinks. You know, so it went from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but uh, it was a great education, you know, and it really sort of prepped me for what was going to come, which was this huge explosion on the British rock scene. Um, if you can imagine that rather heady time, and I do mean that as a pun, um, <laughs> where you would have the Beatles and, of course, uh, that tremendous explosion. And we looked at the Beatles like, oh, my, look at these guys. This is incredible. You know, it really did change our world. Um, but I was really fortunate. I was working at a really cool studio and then sort of worked my way through the British London studios until I came uh, to a studio called Olympic. Olympic was, at that time, well, let me back up a little bit. Studios in London were owned by record labels. You had Philips, Decca, Pi, EMI, and on and on. All the major labels had recording studios. Olympic was a 
an independent studio. So therefore, we didn't care which label hired us, but we wanted to be the best, and we were. We were really an aggressively cool studio with a lot of modern technology. I, some of the photographs that were wandering around on the screen here, you probably saw shots of Olympic and me at the console. That was in 1967 at Olympic, which is where everything really came together for me. Um, it was um, a haven for what I call the rock gentry. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, Rolling Stones, Traffic, Joe Cocker, you just name it, and of course the Beatles. We were very lucky. We actually got to record the Beatles. Um, I, was, I recorded them twice, I was very fortunate. And that was the only time I actually was scared. I was nervous as all hell. And I was taking pictures, as you could see. I used to have my camera and just haul it out and take pictures of Jimmy and the Stones, and nobody said anything. They didn't give a damn. There was no manager saying, well, you can't take a picture of my artist. But the Beatles was like, oh, 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 dear. You know, it was like serious royalty time. You know, you just didn't mess with the Beatles. And I figured if I took my camera out, one or two things were going to happen. One, I'd be dead. Or two, I'd be fired. So I decided, you know, don't take the camera out. But um, it was great. I mean, they were, they were wonderful to work with. And we can talk about that afterwards, because I don't want to get too sidetracked. But I was working with uh, Jimmy um, at Olympic. I got introduced to him there. And um, how I got to meet Jimmy was that um, the studio manager was this very lovely lady. She was very prim and proper. And she said, oh, Eddie, there's this American chappy with the big hair. And you do all that weird shit anyway, so why don't you do him? <laughs> hey, you know, you can't turn her down. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I got to meet Jimmy. Um, so I did uh, Axis, and uh, obviously our experience, and then Axis. And then I was invited to come to the United States in 68. And um, the studio that invited me over was a studio called The Record Plant in New York City. And uh, oh, thank you. I've got one here, but thank you. I've got another one. Yeah, you have that one. Got a beer. <laughs> hey, hey, where is the? Is, okay. Um, so I was asked to come to the U.S. by the record plant because Jimmy was making the transition from the U.K. Now he was a big star. He was coming back to America to live. Excuse me. So um, 1968 at the record plant, um, I come into the studio and it's. I've come from four track, which is how we recorded all the original album, the first two albums, to 12 track, one inch. You saw it in some of those pictures there. Wow, what a jump in technology. But um, I continued my work with him. We recorded Electric Ladyland. I went on to record many other bands, a lot of. At that time, it was the British invasion, was in, it was coming over to the US. and. All the bands came over to the United States. And that's how Jimmy got a lot of the musicians to work with him. That shot of him playing the bass at the scene club, upside down, that's where he would go to figure out which musicians he was going to get to play with him that night. And Voodoo Child was recorded that way. He would just steal the musicians from the club and drag them over to the studio, which was two blocks away. Um, Woodstock, 69, I was very fortunate I recorded that. Three days of drugs and hell. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, three days of drugs and hell. I don't know. Do I remember what happened there? No, I don't. <laughs> um, after that, I was involved in building Electric Ladyland Studios for Jimmy, which uh, opened in 1970. Uh, we took a year to build and it cost a million dollars in those days, which was a lot of money. And Jimmy had to keep going out on the road to make enough money to build the studio. Um, after that, hello, can I help you? Um, I guess I just decided that was it. I'd done enough independent engineering. I wanted to become a producer, became an independent producer engineer. 
And I've really, I've worked in this business, this is a crazy business, and it's never been more crazy than now as we notice that uh, the old business model is right out the window. It's gone. There are maybe three record companies left, three major labels. And it's now the year of the independence, the independent labels, independent uh, publishers. Anybody can make a record in their basement, as we've proven. Um, you know, hooray for, for waves and for Pro Tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are other things. There are other things coming. I've been in the business for 40 years, and it seems like yesterday. It really does. It's amazing. Here we are, 2008, and I'm involved with this whole new way of doing things. And I never thought I'd actually be on the stage talking about a digital plugin. And it's very exciting because I went over to meet with the Waves guys, and we sat down very carefully and listened to a lot of these plugins. And I, I find it very hard to tell. I, sometimes I can't. I mean, my ears are pretty decent, but I can't tell the difference between the real thing and the plugin, which really makes life easier for you guys. Um, and I use the guys in a generic sense here. Please, mm -hmm. ladies, don't be insulted. Um, it's it's an amazing way of recording. Now, what am I doing today? I am recording and producing several bands, uh, an English band that has actually very kindly generate, uh, donated this uh, track that we're going to experiment with. Uh, and this track was recorded at Abbey Road um, about three, well, three weeks ago. No, actually, about a month ago, excuse me. I'm also involved in the restoration of the complete Woodstock. We found about 10 hours of unreleased material, which makes life very exciting for me, because I'm mixing it in 5.1 surround sound. I'm generally restoring the entire show from the time it started to the time it finishes, which is a, a mammoth year-long project. In addition to which, I'm also working, of course, on yet another Hendrix movie, which is, uh, I can't tell you the name of it, but it's an amazing, amazing performance of Jimmy Live, also in 5.1 surround. And that'll come out next year. The, the, the Woodstock one next year will be 40 years anniversary. Can you believe that? That's pretty weird. 69 to 2009. Um, and of course, in, in, the, in the process of working on these movies, I'm using a lot of waves, plugins, things to clean up the tracks, things to help the process. I'm doing things now which I could never even begun to consider 15 years ago. Just would never have even happened. <laughs> Excuse me. So, this band that I was working with in London, uh, normally I would go into a rehearsal studio and do some pre-production, because that's the way you're supposed to do it. You know, you don't want to go waste time in the studio, but we didn't have that time. I was in London for a very brief visit, and they said, can we get in? And we got into the studio. We went in, and I did pre-production, recording, overdubbing, and the whole thing in three days. We, I cut four tracks in three days, and this is one of the tracks. I mixed it here in the US at a, in Los Angeles at a studio called The Mix Room. We used uh, Studio 3 at Abbey Road. And um, you know all of this pressure to get it all done quickly was great. It, it added a spontaneous feel to it. And everything is cut at the same time. I, you know, We may have overdubbed and f fixed a few things. But to me, one of the great pleasures and joys in life is to put a band that can actually play together. <laughs> And go in the studio and have them all record at the same time. What a unique concept. Who would have thought of that? As opposed to going, all right, here's a click track, put the bass drum and put the snare on, and then put the high, and come on. You know, that's not making music. That's making a computer program. But it's true that if you're one person and that's all you have, you can put the drums on first and the bass on. But it does lose a bit in the translation. So what we have is <coughs> some tracks, which I hope we, we're going to play. Um, I can tell you a little bit about how it was set up. Um, it's a big live room, uh, drums in the big room, amps separated, 
the bass amp and the two guitar amps are separate. Um, so I record on analog tape, 24 track, two inch, Dolby SR, 15 IPS. Why? Anybody know? Give it out to the whole audience. Anybody? Why? Better sound. Well, better sound, yeah. OK, you're not quite there yet. Anything? Well, wait, 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 one at a time. That's part of it. Part of it. Not part of it. Who said that? There you go. There's a, in France, we call it the bump. There's a beautiful bump at 15 IPS, right? <laughs> If you looked at a graph of what 15 does, what does it do? It puts a bump in the bottom end, <laughs> OK? So all of those factors, the, the bump in the bottom end on playback, the tape saturation, and the Dolby SR, what does the Dolby SR do? Anybody? <laughs> what? Mm, well, what it does is keeping the noise level down, right? But it also imparts a little bit of a sound to it that is, well, it, Essentially, Dolby SR at 15, you would want that because at 15, it's a little noisy. Now, in the old days, we didn't have Dolby SR, and we didn't care about that. If you look at the Hendrix stuff, I mean, there's four to four to four. I mean, it's like three four to fours, and who cared about the noise? But I happen to like what Dolby does. Anyway, so that's how we do it. Now, what do we do? We take that tape, and we transfer it, kicking and screaming, into the digital world. The trick with that is when you go into Pro Tools, one of the most important things that you must do is to address the issue of word clock. And I always use something like Apogee Big Ben, because you want all those little numbers to go, they all got to line up together. Um, I like to use um, different kinds of uh, A to D converters. Um, the ones in the HD are very good, but I have a personal preference for Prism, MyTech, uh, okay, well, you, you name it. I like to use some kind of um, other manufacturer for the A to D trans uh, uh, transfer of the, of the sound, because then I feel I've really done the best I can. 24-bit, 96K, I'm there. Well, I think now we're in Pro Tools, all right? Now we've got my session there. What do I do next? After I've done all the overdubs and finished the, I've got some overdubs in tape, but the rest of the sound has been done in Pro Tools with great mic pre's. Oh, the one thing I did forget to tell you that the console was an SSL J, but I didn't use the J preamps. What did I use? I used the new Neve mic pre's as outboard mic pre's before it even hit the, the SSL. <coughs> OK, after that, we, uh, we finished our overdubbing process, and now I'm going to mix. I, when I mix, I'm mixing in LA with a J series, but I'm mixing two half-inch tape with Dolby SR at 15 RPS. So the process is analog, digital, analog. But then I take that half-inch finished master and dump it back into Pro Tools so I have two versions of it. I never go straight to Pro Tools. Why am I doing that? Because of the bump, right? So I get it both ends of, of the spectrum, balances out, and also warms up the sound. Let's listen to where we started. Let's listen to, say, the bass drum. Um, this is without EQ. Monsieur, oh la ha. Oh, look, it's EQ. <laughs> so here's the foot without. Um, we'll play the mix, by the way, at the very end. Uh, but this is the bass drum without anything. Maybe a bit more. A bit more. That's good. Okay. Now let's put in what we did to it. OK. Cool. So you can see the Waves plugin made a hell of a difference, didn't it? EQ and compression and gating. He's looking to see. What the hell did he do over there? 
<laughs> Do you know what? I don't know why I did. I just twiddled the knob. <laughs> oh, yeah, about there. Yeah, 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 that's okay, right there. <laughs> and I hadn't had a couple of beers then. Um, I know you're probably going to have questions about what I did. If you wouldn't mind just sort of keeping a mental note or write on your friend's cheek or something. <coughs> Do it, we'll, we'll do the questions and answer later. 